this week. This is already week seven. My name is Othon Anastasakis and I'm the director of Southeast European Studies at Oxford. Uh, as I said, it's week seven, so uh, we only have eight weeks in Oxford, the smallest uh, term in the UK, together with Cambridge. So that means that we are reaching the end. Uh, and this is our last week of uh, webinar. So we left um, uh, one of the best for last. Uh, and uh, during this term, we've been discussing issues of geopolitics in terms of um, energy, migration, uh, or security issues. Uh, but, um, you know, this one is about politics, and it's about politics in the Balkans, uh, and um, about democracy and how communists have been uh, hanging in there 30 years after the end of, um, of the collapse of communism. Uh, more we'll hear from our speakers. This is an excellent panel. I would just like to introduce um, the chair of the panel, uh, who is uh, Jonathan Shield. Jonathan Shield has been, is one of our senior associates at CSOX. He's also the editor of our blogs, but uh, Jonathan has a long career in the European Commission uh, and uh, a very long experience on enlargement issues. He spent a long time in Romania as well uh, as the ambassador there of the European Union. Uh, so he's uh, very well equipped to understand all the political realities in the Balkans. And uh, our panel is a very Oxford panel, I could say. There's also the background with Ellie that reminds us where, where we should be, and we actually are in our, all in our rooms. Uh, but um, it's an Oxford panel in the sense that uh, both Ellie and Mihai are teaching in Oxford, and Milos has done his, um, his DPhil in Oxford. So with that, uh, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to enjoy from the background. Uh, and um, hand it over to uh, Jonathan. Thank you very much indeed, Othon. Welcome to everybody at today's uh, session. Um, and thank you, Othon, for eclipsing yourself. Um, it's 31 years or so since the major disruption that came in Central and Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And this was followed later in the 90s by the collapse of Yugoslavia. Uh, and democracy or something approach, approaching it was established across the region, in Southeast and Central Europe, but in a situation where certainly for Southeastern Europe, there'd previously be no effective alternative to the ruling communist parties in each country. And as a result, it was hardly surprising that the political scene when multi-party systems gradually established themselves, uh, that this scene was dominated by members of the former communist elites. And, but this situation has to a great extent persisted over the last 30 years, even if nominally socialist parties have not always stayed in power. Ex-communist elites have, in a number of cases, not hesitated to change their ideological brand in order to preserve their hold on power and harvest the fruits of that power. And parties of all nominal tendencies, uh, from uh, European People's Party uh, through liberals to so the Socialist Party, have at times provided a platform for them. And they've also been active in some of the more nationalist parties. More recently, we have seen in some of the countries in the region, massive grassroots protest against the results of this situation, uh, the corruption, the clientelism and, and so forth. Uh, and I suppose the question is, has that led to anything? We are in some countries, Romania, notably seeing the foundation of new political parties, but the foundation of new political parties hasn't always been something which has, uh, they haven't always had a very long life. Uh, but some of these parties do see themselves free of the influence of the ex-communist elite. At the same time, the ex-communist elite parties have continued to appeal uh, and gain support from a large swathe of of voters, particularly rural conservative voters. There are elections due to take place in several countries over the next year, December the 6th already in Romania, and that was one of the reasons why uh, we originally came up with this idea, the idea of this seminar. So, but it does seem appropriate to look at the prospects 
for the ex-communist elites across the region. Are we at last seeing a secular change? Or is any change of power likely to be short-lived? Or indeed, do the new parties risk falling into the same habits as their predecessors, despite their declared aims? To help us pick out the answers to these questions, we have three speakers today. Eli Gateva, who, as Otton has said, is a lecturer at the Department of Politics and International Relations here in Oxford. And she, as unsurprisingly given her name, will focus mainly on the situation in Bulgaria. Mihai Chirkiru, lecturer at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies, focusing principally on Romania. And uh, last but not least, Milos Damjanovic, who is now a freelance political analyst based in Belgrade, but as often as mentioned, he's very much part of the CSOX team. And he will look at what's happening in the Western Balkans, particularly Montenegro and Serbia. Julie Adams, our administrator, masquerading a CSOX webinar, will be posting full CVs of the speakers on the chat function. So I won't go further into their excellent qualifications for this discussion. You can read that yourself. Each speaker will make a presentation of around 12 minutes, following which there will be a Q&A. Could you please post your questions on the Q&A function? Uh, you will find you can't, you, you can't post anything on the chat function. If you'd like to pose your question yourself, please do indicate this and we can then unmute you when it comes time for you to ask your question. Otherwise, I'll be happy to ask the question on your behalf. And we'll aim to wrap up this afternoon's webinar by about quarter past five GMT. Uh, I would say that this today's webinar is a little bit of, of a precursor looking at the politics of the region uh, for looking at different themes related to the politics of the regions and affected uh, by the politics of the regions, which we will have in the CSOX uh, core seminar series next term, starting in January. So uh, do keep your mailboxes open for CSOX emails so that uh, you can join that. But without further ado, over to Ellie. Hello, just give me one second to share my uh, slides. Right, um, so I will try to be as brief as possible. Uh, the plan for the presentation is very briefly to look at some of the key developments in Bulgarian political life since the collapse of communism in 1989. Um, after that, I will briefly reflect on some of the key themes and topics that have influenced political debates. Um, I will also talk about the recent protests that have been taking place since the summer. And then I will conclude by reflecting on some of the challenges and uncertainties when it comes to the next parliamentary elections that are scheduled to, play, to take place in March next year. Um, so very briefly, I'm sure most of you will be aware, and, and now my slides are not moving, strangely enough, so we'll be stuck on this wonderful picture in the main square. Um, otherwise, I was going to show you a picture of some of the protests that took place back in 1989. Uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, democratic transition in Bulgaria started in November 89. 1899, uh, there was an internal coup within the Bulgarian Communist Party, ousted its leader, and uh, one of the perhaps key defining features uh, in terms of developments in Bulgaria compared to most Central and Eastern European countries is that um, there were no strong opposition parties developed during the 80s, and when the first democratic elections took place uh, in the 90s, um, the outcome was that the opposition parties that joined forces together in the Union of Democratic Forces gained only 36% of the vote. Um, and as a result of that, we had the Bulgarian Socialist Party, the successor of the Bulgarian Communist Party, winning the first democratic elections in Bulgaria, which is again, perhaps one of the few exceptions in Central and Eastern Europe where this has happened. Um, and during the uh, 90s, we can see that there was perhaps a bipolar system that was established in Bulgaria, 
Um, although they will rely on some of the smaller parties, um, there was more or less a two-party system along the line of communism, anti-communist cleavages in Bulgaria. Things were about to change and in 2001 uh, there was a very important um, and significant development that was quite a huge blow to uh, the political, to the bipolar system in Bulgaria. So we had the establishment of a new political movement uh, and uh, this was uh, the national movement Simeon II. It was based around the personality of the ex-monarch who has lived in exile and um, uh, they basically appeared overnight, um, became a contender and secured half of the seats in uh, the Bulgarian parliament, which was uh, quite a volatile um, of development and uh, re-establishment of the party system in Bulgaria. So instability will continue again in 2005. Uh, this time there were seven political parties and the establishment of the coalition government uh, between the national movement, Simeon II, the Socialist Party, uh, but also the movement for freedoms and rights. And since 2009, um, most of the period has been dominated by a new centre-right party, a GERP party, um, and uh, here now we have currently the third Borisov government is in place. Obviously, there have been brief periods uh, when they have not been in power and in 2013 uh, but also after 2016 and 2017 there were a number of elections taking place uh, in Bulgaria and uh, now it seems despite the protests that they will be able to finish their mandate and the next elections are scheduled to take place in March um, next year but I will talk a little bit more about the elections in a few seconds so um, uh, this has been very much the political uh, landscape when we look at different political parties in Bulgaria. There are perhaps two uh, other important features that I would like to highlight when we think about the legacies of communism um, in Bulgaria, but also in the region. Uh, I think it's important to remember um, a weak state capacity is a fundamentally important feature in terms of understanding key challenges and developments uh, in Bulgaria, uh, but also another significant aspect is the system of patronage and informality, so key differences between formal rules um, and the significance and impo importance uh, of informal networks. And uh, this is also uh, particularly important with relevance of the nexus of political and economic elites in the country. Um, so I think that we should keep those in mind when we analyze developments, not only focus on the political parties. And, um, and now uh, these very much have influenced political campaigns. Corruption burst on the scene back in 2001 um, when the ex-monarch came. Um, Anti-corruption was very much on the agenda and it has remained a common theme in Bulgaria for a very long period of time, I mean, almost 20 years. Uh, it's likely to be the case again, uh, but we have also seen um, in the last couple of years, another issue has um, gained attention uh, the rule of law and the efficiency of the judiciary system. What has happened this summer um, is perhaps one of the most interesting and relevant examples of how to televise the significance or the importance of the rule of law. Uh, Christo Ivanov, um, who is um, a member of Democratic Bulgaria, uh, tried to reach one of the Bulgarian beaches uh, near the sea Black Sea town of Burgas, but was prevented from doing so uh, by the bodyguards guarding the seaside villa slash mansion of the honorary leader of one of the Bulgarian political parties, the Movement for Freedom and Rights. Um, and this very much highlighted the significance and the importance uh, of having strong checks and balances and fundamentally about having uh, rights equally applied to everyone. And so he was not granted access to exclusive uh, state territory that he should have been allowed to reach um, and this in turn has perhaps uh, enhanced the significance of the rule of law from a 
um, issue considered to be an intellectual matter. Uh, it had the potential to reach to more Bulgarian citizens and galvanize the protests. Uh, protests in Bulgaria have been going on since the 9th of July, uh, so more than 130 days uh, people have been get gathering um, in Sofia, but in also in some cases in other towns uh, and cities to demand the resignation of the current government. Um, again, uh, with very little time left for the mandate, um, it's unlikely that there will be a resignation, uh, but nevertheless, they have uh, this protest significantly enhanced the profile of democratic Bulgaria. Um, and I will tell you a, a little bit more about the predictions um, that we have for in terms of the outcomes of the next uh, parliamentary elections in Bulgaria. So there will be new parties, many new kids on the block. Um, uh, one of the parties that is likely to gain quite a considerable uh, share of the public vote is a party that has recently been set up uh, by a Bulgarian entertainer, a talk show host and a comedian, and that he has established, uh, he tried twice actually the second time, um, he managed to uh, register his party that is called um, There Are Such People. Um, so projections uh, at this stage um, suggest that around 14% of the voters are willing to give their support to this new political party, which is quite a substantial uh, development, but obviously we'll wait and see. Um, there is also um, another political party that has been established uh, by the former Bulgarian ombudsman that is called a stand up. Uh, and uh, they are also projected to gain more than 5% of the vote. Um, we also have, um, I think it was just a couple of days ago, um, a, a declaration for a new political project or a new political party to be launched um, by um, uh, uh, Vasil Boshkov, and some of you might be aware that he has been um, in exile uh, due uh, to a challenging issue with his business. So a new project that he would like to launch as the Bulgarian Summer. Um, and we also need to remember that there will be enhanced support for democratic Bulgaria. And in some cases, they indicate that they could be the fourth a new power in the Bulgarian parliament. Um, and at the same time, support is likely to drop for GERP around 20%. Um, and similar percentages are also given for the Socialist Party in Bulgaria. So fundamentally, it seems that there will be at least um, two or three uh, new parties in the Bulgarian parliament. Um, and that the potential for coalition or for coalition governments, at least at this stage, seems to be quite limited. Um, I would like to highlight um, two key issues that we need to bear in mind. Um, so the first one is obviously the current uh, COVID situation in Bulgaria is having a significant impact and a significant uh, strain. Um, so there is speculation whether there will be a need to delay um, at the, the elections that are scheduled to take place in March. There is a possibility to delay them till May, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. So far, neither the president nor the parliament are willing to consider that. Um, and even if they're not delayed, let's say if they take place when they're scheduled to take place uh, on the 28th of March, uh, the question remains how many of Bulgarian citizens will feel safe enough to go and vote and to what extent uh, the ongoing situation is also likely to have a significant impact on the new issues uh, that might be uh, on the agenda, but fundamentally the turnout for, uh, for this um, elections will be quite unpredictable, uh, which means that any indication that we have in terms of intentions to vote at this stage um, perhaps could be um, significantly misguided. So we have to wait and see, uh, but nevertheless there will be at least three new parties, probably more new parties uh, competing um, for uh, public uh, votes in the next parliamentary elections. Uh, it seems that um, GERP will lose their dominant hold on political power. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, the socialists uh, are unlikely to be basically provided quite a significant shock to the um, existing um, 
system within the Bulgarian political party. Um, so I would like to uh, conclude and basically um, say that some of the biggest issues um, remain very much on the agenda. And uh, here we have a continued focus on um, high level corruption, efficiency within the judiciary, now with a much firmer and closer focus on the effectiveness of the prosecution, uh, but also the recent COVID crisis has exposed the fundamental weaknesses of Bulgarian he health sector. And um, that this is also likely to have a significant impact on um, the issues that will take, um, a, will be uh, the focus of the next parliamentary elections. Um, so we will have to wait and see. I would say that um, I'm cautiously optimistic is that there might be some new important developments likely to take place in March. Uh, but so far, it seems um, that um, it's going to be incredibly unpredictable. And this is exactly where I will stop. And if you have more questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you very much indeed, Ellie. And congratulations, you hit the 12 minute mark almost uh, to the second, I think. Uh, setting a very good example for the other speakers. Mihai, over to you. Uh, could you unshare your screen, please, Ellie? Thanks. Yeah. Mihai, you're, you're, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, for this invitation. Uh, there are really many commonalities between uh, Bulgaria and Romania, and that will become uh, obvious from from the uh, slides that I'll be uh, presenting. So uh, let me just start by, by saying that the Romanian Communist Party was really a party for all seasons and also for all ideologies. So uh, unlike the other countries um, uh, in, in the region, uh, you don't have only one communist successor party in Romania, but two. So I'll be mostly focusing on the Social Democrats, which governed Romania for most of the period since 1989. But uh, there was also a second uh, successor party, the Democrats, who used to be affiliated with the Socialist International and then they moved to the EPP in, in 2004. And um, this party merged with the, with the party that is governing Romania at the, at the moment, the National Liberals. So uh, you, you could say that the main right wing and main left wing parties in Romania have um, um, within their acts either um, communist, uh, former communist elites or they, they, they do share some uh, organizational legacies from the Romanian communist parties. Uh, Party. And of course, there were also some other authoritarian diasporas, uh, both uh, radical left and radical right parties, which were relevant in the 90s, but um, afterwards they, uh, they, they disappeared. Romanian communism was very much like the Bulgarian communism, uh, a type of communism that was characterized uh, by its um, reliance on uh, clientelistic networks and, um, and patronage, not very institutionalized. So. Um, that carried over, that kind of patrimonial communist legacy carried over within the, in, in the practices of the, of the parties that were formed uh, after uh, 89. And I'll return to that uh, in, in a second. Um, I, I, as I said, I'll be focusing uh, mostly on the evolution of the social democrats, um, which are, and are the largest party in Romania in terms of membership, one of the largest in the, in the region as well. And they were able to maintain and expand this party organization uh, despite some splits. Some of them were um, uh, older, other more, more recent. Uh, they they complemented their extensive organization with uh, reliance on clientelistic networks and, and patronage practices and high level corruption as well, which made them quite successful, um, uh, but also kept several parts of Romania in a uh, uh, plane under uh, development. There are a few ideological issues that I would like to um, sort of emphasize uh, in, in the evolution of the party because they, I think, are relevant also for other parties in the, uh, in the region. So uh, the Social Democrats, like the Bulgarian Socialist Party um, in the 90s, um, shared um, a hard economic left position. So um, they were against privatization, against the liberalization of uh, prices, uh, against shock therapy reforms with um, uh, authoritarian uh, positions on the social uh, values dimension. So mostly xenophobic uh, nationalism directed uh, against the um, uh, Hungarian minority. That 
tended to change when the um, EU integration process started and uh, their interaction of the party with, uh, with, with European elites and the um, a socialist international. So what, what Vakudova and Hugia would be, would be calling the EU integration magnet. So parties like the Romanian socialist and the Bulgarian socialist were brought closer to uh, the values of the EU. So more centrist or rightist economic policies um, and also more moderate positions on the uh, social values uh, axis. After uh, Romania uh, joined the uh, EU, um, there was again uh, an ideological transformation in the party in the sense that uh, some of this mimicking at least of the progressiveness on the, on the social values axis changed. So they, the, the social democrats returned uh, to more traditional um, uh, positions and, and, and values. And that was very much uh, visible uh, in their campaign, in the presidential campaign in 2014, when their candidate was against an ethnic German, uh, a Romanian uh, with, with uh, uh, German heritage, and they used xenophobic um, um, rhetoric against, uh, against him. Um, and it was also visible during the most recent um, referendum on um, the idea of introducing a clause against uh, gay marriages in the, uh, in, in the constitution. So that's, um, that's a change that was relevant for the, for the party in, in, in recent years. Another relevant change was um, uh, the fact that economically the party now has a very interesting um, 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 stance. So they combine uh, measures uh, that have a welfare tendency, let's say. So they uh, increased quite a lot when they were in power, a minimum wage, uh, pensions, um, hoping that this kind of, um, um, of, of increase in the disposable income would lead to more consumption and to uh, economic growth. And to some extent that was, that was true, although there were also increasing deficits. At the same time, they, uh, they matched that with a lot of pro-business measures, especially tax cuts uh, and incentives for, for investors. So their economic policy is rather, uh, rather centrist. The last aspect, which is really important for, for this party is the, uh, their anti-anti-corruption fight. So corruption became the main uh, issue dominating uh, Romanian politics since the early 2000s, and usually um, it was used by, their, by the opponents of the Social Democrats as their main rhetoric tool. And this being the largest party, um, and also a party with the kind of um, uh, organization legacy that I, I, I've been talking about, definitely they, they were uh, among the politicians prosecuted and convicted. Um, and uh, some of the leaders of the party felt that this uh, uh, anti-corruption fight was politicized and at some point was also uh, going beyond constitutional norms. And they started to trying to push back that, uh, that anti-corruption fight. Um, and, uh, and that at, at some point also backfired uh, uh, spectacularly. And, be, and I'll, be, I'll be mentioning that uh, soon. Before, before that, I, would, I just wanted to, um, to, to give you um, a short um, illustration where the, where, well, where, where the main party, parties in Romania are, are, are standing um, with this uh, data from the uh, Chapel Hill uh, expert survey. So if one compares um, Romania six years ago with, with, with the current party scene, one can see that there is a new uh, party which, which emerged recently, the Save Romania Union, which finally uh, exposes some social progressive um, uh, positions, unlike all the other parties in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the party system. And this party also is an anti-corruption party. Initially, um, they uh, exposed a rather centrist uh, ideology, saying that they uh, go beyond the traditional left versus right conflict. But more recently, they positioned themselves also uh, on the economic left side dimension, more to the, to the uh, right. Whereas the social democrats were relatively stable, uh, maybe moving a bit more towards more authoritarian uh, positions. Now, just to recap, uh, because we have elections coming up uh, in less than, uh, less than two weeks, I said they was in government for most of the uh, last four years. They won the 2016 elections by a landslide. No one, no one really expected that. But they did benefit from a, a very interesting campaign where they, they promised a lot to um, all sorts of uh, constituencies, like they would have a, a magic key. And actually, they were able to deliver to some extent on, on these promises. I mentioned the uh, increases in uh, wages and in, in pensions and also the tax cuts for, for the business. But this didn't lead to uh, an increase in popularity or a stabilization of their support. On the contrary, and that happened 
because the uh, party leader uh, pushed uh, a lot of this agenda of the anti-anti-corruption fight and they attempted repeatedly to decriminalize certain corruption acts and also to weaken uh, the anti-corruption fight um, in, in various ways and, and that led to massive protests January 2017, uh, 2018 uh, as well and also it led to instability within the party. The, the party leader had a previous suspended um, sentence so he couldn't become a prime minister uh, and that's why that's why he appointed a proxies to, to, to be uh, to, to lead the cabinets and when these proxies were refusing to actually uh, go with his agenda he actually had to re remove them and and in one of the cases it meant that uh, the party actually uh, introduced a motion of no confidence against its own uh, cabinet and, and toppled that down so that also affected the reputation of the, of, of the party quite a lot um, and the, the, the party leader and the party itself became much more unpopular. They lost heavily the, um, the European par parliament elections. The second day, the party leader was uh, imprisoned. And that led uh, also later on to the party being removed from, from government. At the moment, since, since late 2019, the party has a new leader, which is a relatively young politician, not a very inspiring or high profile one, who's now just in his second term as an, as an MP. He did try to distance the party a bit from the anti-corruption uh, anti fight. He removed from, from the party list for the uh, next elections um, some of the politicians which were associated with the previous uh, leadership. Um, and he also seems to be continuing with the same mix of uh, economic uh, policy promises like, like his predecessor. In terms of the uh, pandemic crisis, which has hit Romania quite, quite, quite badly um, as well, uh, one has to say that the Social Democrats were not able to really capitalize on, on the uh, liberals, uh, liberal government poor management of the, of the pandemic. They are trying to score some points by placing some very well-known physicians on their, uh, on their lists, but uh, it's doubtful whether that would uh, actually work and it would help them to bounce back from, uh, from their previous uh, defeats in, uh, in elections. Now, just to reflect a bit on, on the developments more uh, largely in the, uh, in the Romania, on the Romanian party scene. So this anti-corruption movement has indeed some grassroots um, 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 social uh, basis. And the new party that I mentioned, the uh, Save Romania Union and PLUS, uh, so this is also a new party, and they, 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 they merged recently, are the main beneficiary. Um, of this anti-corruption um, 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 movement, but they suffer from shallow organization. So at the recent local elections, they were uh, able to um, win seats in only uh, half of the counties of the, uh, of, of the country. And when anti-corruption is not very salient, as uh, it was the case for the local elections, their uh, score decreased dramatically compared to the uh, European Parliament election. Romania is also characterized by massive emigration, and the diaspora vote can indeed be consequential, but only at those elections where there is um, a national uh, constituency. So for the parliamentary elections, the diaspora can't really make a difference. There are only six MPs that would, would represent the diaspora. There is some evidence of an indirect effect um, as well with uh, communities that have experienced high, rate, high rates of migration voting more for the right-wing parties, so for the liberals or the um, uh, safe Romania uh, union. Now, uh, to conclude um, with, with uh, a few thoughts on the um, uh, perspectives for, for Romanian politics on the short term, most likely the National Liberal Party will win the election. Um, the, the main question that uh, they, they would have to answer is whether they prefer to um, govern in a coalition with other parties from the uh, European People's Party, or they would also take on board the, um, this uh, new anti-corruption party to save uh, Romania Union. Um, although the, the uh, socialists will not be in power, we will probably continue to see um, authoritarian tendencies and uh, high-level corruption. Uh, some of the um, announcements of the uh, current prime minister uh, are um, 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 really pose, pose uh, some serious concerns they announced uh, the form of the constitutional court, which should not be uh, in line with uh, rule of law, rule of law uh, conventions, um, and if the uh, uh, USR Plus party would uh, would join the cabinet, they are probably not very ready to to demonstrate higher competence. They didn't really use the past four years in parliament to 
build a, a party machine and to develop a, a professionalized uh, public policy um, uh, think tank that, that would help them uh, with, with, with governing. So some of the high hopes that are put in this party, I'm afraid, would be uh, uh, met with, um, with quite a lot of, of disappointment. And considering the economic crisis that, that Romania is, uh, is, is facing and the plans of the uh, uh, main writing parties to privatize healthcare and to cut public sector jobs and also probably their need to impose austerity measure, all that would mean that the social democrats are well positioned for a, for a comeback um, um, soon. Um, and there is also no, pros no prospect for the social democrats to be reforming themselves and to uh, transform the, themselves into a modern social democratic party, uh, abandoning the clientelistic and, and, and patronage uh, practices that I've, I've mentioned. And part of that has to, has to do with the fact that there is no real challenge on the left uh, spectrum, uh, uh, in the uh, left part of the political spectrum in, in Romania, and most of their electorate are, um, are uh, captive. So I will, uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your uh, comments and, and questions. Thank you very much indeed, Mihai. Um, just to uh, uh, encourage you, uh, those who want to ask questions, to put them in. We have, uh, you'll have seen that we have one question already. Do feel free to uh, ask them. Now over to Milos uh, for the concluding first round of presentations. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so I will mainly talk about Serbia and Montenegro. Um, both countries had very similar initial transitions away from communism, including when it comes to the fate of the ex-communist elites. In Serbia in 1990, the former communists essentially rebranded themselves as the Socialist Party of Serbia, led by Slobodan Milosevic, until then the leader of the Serbian communists. Um, the bulk of the party's membership was inherited from the League of Communists. Uh, importantly, the socialists also inherited the assets of the former League of Communists and elite continuity was also maintained in the economy where most of the old uh, managerial elite remained in place, um, exchanging its membership in the League of Communists for membership of the new socialists. Uh, a similar story happened in Montenegro. The Democratic Party of Socialists was similarly created as a successor to the League of Communists of Montenegro. Um, in fact, in Montenegro, in the first multi-party elections in, held in December 1990, uh, it was still the League of Communists of Montenegro, which took part, winning 56% of the votes cast at the time. Um, and it was only in June 1991 that the communists finally transformed themselves into the currently, uh, what they're currently known as the Democratic Party of Socialists. Um, a notable difference at this stage between the two countries was a generational one. Uh, while in Serbia, the ex-communists, now the socialists led by Milosevic were already graying. Uh, Milosevic was 50, I think, in 1990. Um, in Montenegro, it was um, quite a youthful communist leadership which emerged as the new leadership of the Democratic Party of Socialists. So the party leader, Momir Bulatovic at the time, was in his early 30s in 1991. Uh, Milo Djukanovic, the current president of Montenegro, was only 29 when he became Prime Minister of Montenegro in 1991, which means that 30 years later, he's still a sprightly, uh, what, 59 year old, and yet still running the country. Um, there, there was a joke at the time that due to their youthful appearances, the, the, the clique that was leading Montenegro was known as the jumpers, because unlike the communist elite, which walked around in suits and ties, uh, these guys walked around in knitted jumpers, uh, which gave them a sort of younger, fresher look. Um, the transitions in the two countries were quite different in a sense from other former Yugoslav countries. So while we had this uh, elite uh, continuity in Serbia and Montenegro, even if there was an ideological change, um, in countries such as Croatia or Bosnia, you had a different situation. You had the nationalist opposition to the communists coming to power, um, although Ironically, in terms of ideologies and um, ideologies and policies, the, they were fairly similar in the kind of uh, ideologies that they followed. Um, 
after this period of continuity, there was a period of divergence between Serbia and Montenegro. Um, so in Montenegro specifically, uh, there was a point, an important point of divergence in 1997. This was the moment when a split occurred within the ruling DPS elite between Bulatovic, who was the party leader until then, and Djukanovic, who was the prime minister. Um, Bulatovic lost in this power struggle within the party, which was then verified in presidential elections in 1997, in which uh, Djukanovic became the president of Montenegro and the leader of the DPS, uh, while Bulatovic went on to form the, um, the Socialist People's Party. Um, and this party really became the first major opposition force to the DPS. So un until then, the DPS had been, I mean, there, there, there were some small opposition movements in Montenegro, but it was only in 1997 that a real sort of dynamic of ruling DPS versus opposition, which was essentially ex-DPS and ex-communist as well, emerged. And these two factions from the old communist party would be competing for power for uh, perhaps the next decade. Um, ironically, the two ex-communist factions, once they emerged in 1997, uh, won a combined 90% of seats in the parliamentary elections, which took place in 1998 in Montenegro. Um, but it was this split within the DPS which did more to shape the Montenegrin political scene to the present day than, you know, the, the, the Communist Party's, um, the end of the Communist Party's monopoly on power in 1990. Uh, as I think you will probably know, the DPS managed to cling on to power until 2020, when it lost the parliamentary elections to um, a varied coalition of opposition parties. Um, the the split and the 1997 split in the DPS came to shape the current political and ideological cleavages in Montenegro. Um, after 1997, the DPS adopted a more pro-Western anti-Milosevic course in, Mon in Montenegro, um, which eventually mutated into a more anti-union with Serbia direction, uh, whereas the SNP as the main opposition remained firmly pro-Milosevic, pro-Serbia, uh, more Western skeptic. In the early 2000s, the DPS began to adopt and define itself more clearly around a Montenegrin ethnic identity, while the SNP and other opposition parties became more defined by a ethnic Serb or pro-Serbian identity. 2006 was another key uh, moment in Montenegro. This was the moment when the country held an independence referendum uh, advocated mainly by the DPS and when it became independent again for the first time since 1918. Um, this was perhaps the moment when the old communist elite finally began to lose its grip over the entire political party scene in Montenegro, uh, primarily because the SNP as the main opposition party began to lose its grip on the opposition scene. So you had new political parties which were much more clearly uh, ethnically Serb in terms of their identity emerging rather than and, and vying for for influence on the opposition with the SNP, to the extent that the SNP has now almost disappeared at present and has been replaced by these by new, rather new elites on the opposition scene, which are much more much more clearly defined in terms of being pro-Serb and pro-Serbia. Um, and since 2006, we've seen a real uh, fragmentation of the opposition political scene in Montenegro, uh, as well as a transformation of the opposition politically from being so that it's no longer can really be seen as being ex communist in nature. Um, 2020 was obviously another key moment in Montenegrin politics, which brought 30 years of DPS rule and indeed 75 years of elite continuity, which back began in 1945 to some sort of close. Um, what comes next in Montenegro is a big unknown. I think two months ago, it looked like the DPS, uh, the successor to the communist party would be confined to the dustbin of history. So momentous did the changes which occurred in the country seem and so unexpected and shocking was it that finally these people were losing power. Um, 
the opposition or what had been the opposition until then had a historic opportunity to remake the country. Um, I think there are signs that the new ruling majority has already stumbled at the first step rather than trying to uh, verify the DPS's defeat by quickly forming a government. They set about bickering over who could and could not hold which ministerial posts in the country uh, and to a lesser extent which direction the new government would take. Um, the, new gov the new majority had an opportunity to seize power and dismantle the DPS's power structure, which is very deeply rooted within the state apparatus. Um, Instead, I think relations within the new majority are so bad that um, it looks like they will probably be able to hold on for perhaps a year, uh, create some kind of freer and fairer election conditions for holding elections. Uh, but basically, the, the, the until recently opposition, which is now set to come to power, is gearing up to fight it out amongst itself over who will who will come out on top in the next elections. Um, this is very different from had they taken the opportunity to form a, a clear, long lasting, coherent government, dismantle the DPS's rule systematically, and then go to elections in four years time, say, where they could really have, by then I think um, the DPS would probably uh, have imploded, people would have left, joined some of these opposition parties which are now in government, and I think there really would, would be a spent force. Um, what, what we're currently looking at in Montenegro is probably a scenario where actually because it, it looks like elections will be held in about a year's time, the DPS will be able to maintain some coherence or a great deal of coherence because they have an opportunity to do not a lot and hope that they can come back to power in, in a year's time, while the opposition parties, which will now be in government, fight it out amongst themselves. Um, now, if we put Montenegro aside for a moment and turn to Serbia, um, while I would say in Montenegro, um, the story of the political elites was more evolutionary than revolutionary, uh, in Serbia, it's been kind of the opposite. Um, the, the former communist elite, uh, political and economic elite, reigned more or less supreme during the 1990s. Uh, in parallel to this, a uh, very heterogeneous opposition emerged, which gradually gathered support during the course of the 1990s. Um, the opposition included just about everything from radical nationalists to radical anti-nationalists, uh, right-wing, left-wing, liberal, uh, a, mix, a mix of all of this, some were pro-European, some were more Eurosceptic. Um, opposition parties made the first significant inroads into the, uh, into the ex-communists rule during the 1996 elections uh, in Serbia, when they took power at the local level. Um, and popular support um, for the overthrow of Milosevic and the socialists may in fact have been there in as early as 1997, but the opposition missed a good opportunity back then because part of it decided to boycott the elections. As I'm sure you all know, 2000 was the big year of We've lost you, Milos. We can't hear you. I don't know what's happening there. Your, no, your mic is still on, but uh, it seems to have packed up. Um, That's better. Yeah? Yeah. OK. Uh, so we have this uh, mo key moment of change in 2000 in Serbia. Um, there was a clear moment of discontinuity. The old, the old communist elite was out. Uh, the new elite that came in was very much the opposition elite, which was forged in the 1990s in opposition to the communists. Uh, these people were very diverse, as I said, uh, but they had several things in common. One was a commitment to establishing a broadly democratic political system, as well as overseeing a transition to a uh, more capitalist market economy. Uh, initially, there was also bro a broadly pro-Western and pro-EU consensus, 
uh, although this began to fray around 2008 and was closely correlated with Kosovo's declaration of independence. Um, the new elite also had its various cleavages and points of division, um, but then we went, we moved to 2012, which ushered in another moment of elite turnover. This was the moment when, um, on the back of the global economic crisis, um, as well as a general sense of frustration with the corruption of the, of the elite which had replaced Milosevic, uh, the new Serbian Progressive Party came to power. Um, now this was again, this was not uh, an ex-communist party or an ex-communist elite. This was a new kind of, a new group of people, a new elite that swept into power and completely removed the previous elite that had ruled the country post Milosevic. Um, they had their roots in the Serbian radical party, which was a, radic a radically nationalist kind of insurgent party from the 1990s, but definitely not an ex-communist party. Um, in the 90s, they oscillated between being in power and being in opposition to Milosevic and his regime. Um, and then the progressives emerged in 2008 as a sort of moderate faction of the radical party, which adopted an outwardly more pro-European discourse, uh, more pro-democratic stance. Um, Having come to power in 2012, um, the current Serbian president, Aleksandar Vucic, and the party leader set about concentrating power in his own hands, uh, creating a system of personalized rule in which he dominates almost all aspects of political life and government in the country. Um, I think the key difference between this new elite, which is currently in power, and the previous uh, group, which were in power in the 2000s, is that whereas the elite that was forged in opposition to Milosevic in the 1990s was committed to playing more or less by the democratic rules of the game, this new group, which is now in power, and which was forged in the 90s as well, but in a very different context, um, because Serbia is plugged into the Western democratic world, they see democratic institutions as a necessary evil, which they can't dismantle, uh, but they see them as something that they're quite happy to hollow out uh, and subvert as much as possible while maintaining this external facade of democracy. What's interesting in Serbia, I think particularly, is that Vucic has not only concentrated power in his own hands, but he's also managed to destroy the political alternatives to him, so to himself and his, his party's rules. So while you have uh, a very large proportion of the population, which is actually opposed to the people who are currently in power, uh, there is next to no kind of systematic organized opposition or opposition parties in Serbia. And still, instead you have these fragments of what you what used to be the people in power or various opposition parties, which have been ground down and atomized in part thanks to the efforts of Vucic and the people in power and in part also thanks to their own infighting. Um, so in Serbia you have um, an interesting sort of vacuum in the in terms of the political elite and in terms of the opposition political elite rather you have the people in power and there is a space available for some kind of opposition parties to emerge but nothing is really, nothing new is emerging, nothing credible is emerging to fill this space, which I think is probably also, I mean, the way that the, the, the current party maintains its power is by ensuring that nothing emerges as an alternative to it for the time being. Uh, so it remains to be seen what, what will actually come out of um, in this, to fill this opposition void. Um, in terms of grassroots politics and movements, I mean, both Serbia and Montenegro have and have had very strong protests. Can I stop you here? I think uh, it's time to go into questions. Perhaps you can come back on the grassroots side yep. uh, uh, later on in, in the Q&A. OK. OK, right. Um, I'm going to go straight to the questions. Uh, Toma Pavlov. Uh, you've posed a couple of questions. If you could uh, unmute and uh, ask them. Hello. Uh, please, yes. 
Yeah. Yes, I hope you can hear me. Greetings from okay. Berlin. My name is Tomo Pavlov. I'm a recent graduate of the Hertie School of Governance here in Berlin, originally from Bulgaria. My question is to Eli um, in how she would position the party of GERP and uh, Prime Minister Boyko Borisov in this discussion about communist elites. Uh, would, uh, would you say